so much for joining us for Armchair Travel to Paris, a live walk in the Latin Quarter of Paris. This is a very special armchair travel presentation. So this morning, French tour guide Patrick Herpy returns to give viewers a live tour of Paris. He'll be walking while Zooming with us to show live video of the Latin Quarter of Paris on the left bank of the uh, Seine River uh, around the Sorbonne. I probably mispronounced half those words. Uh, Patrick will discuss the history of each Paris landmark he spotlights and offer tips to traveling to Paris. And I again want to thank the Friends of the Library and Corning Life Sciences for sponsoring uh, much of our armchair travel presentations. So all nearly 200 of us who are watching live and the many more that will watch the recording, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Patrick for joining us this morning. And Patrick, you can take it away. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, you know, when, when you said the word wedding room, uh, I must be too romantic. I heard wedding room. <laughs> so, okay, how many how many people are in the wedding room? <laughs> so that's getting too much for too much for me, sorry. <laughs> so hello everybody. Hello, Elaine. Hello, all of you that have seen the air. Uh, the name just passing by, I recognize some of the name that I that have seen for in Tewksbury Library and also in some tours when I'm starting doing it since uh, the COVID. So hello to everybody. So today, let me put my camera in the full size for me. Uh, today we are in Paris. Uh, we are uh, neither in the Latin Quarter, I mean neither in the left bank no in the right bank because right now i'm on the bridge <laughs> so meaning a bridge it's above the river <laughs> so there's no no district so far you know they, it's funny in paris the only place where you just have a numbers district are the bridge because the bridge are not considered to be uh, land so due to that when you are in the bridge you can't say if you are in the fifth the sixth the seventh the eighth the ninth <laughs> there is no district on the bridge just the name of the bridge above the river so today we're going to speak about a very interesting subject in Paris. For the no, for the one who doesn't know me, if you've never been with uh, with me, sorry, I've got my cap. Uh, so my name is Patrick. Hello, I'm a, I'm a licensed I'm a licensed tour guide in Paris. So I um, do a lot of, of course, in person tour in Paris. In today, I was uh, this morning. I was in Orsay with a group of six people. That was fantastic. I love to do Orsay. Tomorrow I do the Louvre. And also, I'm very happy to do uh, this kind of webinar. And I'm I'm very honored uh, to do it for the Twigsbury uh, Library and all the members of that. So today we speak about the Latin Quarter. So for that, I just need to get your attention a couple of minutes to understand what is the Latin Quarter and why we name it the Latin Quarter and what the history of this district. And then we're going to stroll, okay? So for that, uh, you will be um, indulgent. Indulgent, I think it's correct in English. Okay, well, you'll, be, you'll be kind because I want to show you a couple of pictures. Time in Paris. So the time in Paris, right now it's quarter past four. And the weather is about in centigrade, about uh, 17 centigrade. The weather is between cloudy, you can see behind me, uh, between cloudy and sunny. And uh, the sun will set today by 7 p.m. So we do this tour during uh, during the daylight, okay? And we shouldn't have got any rain. I mean, no rain is forecast, but I've got my umbrella in case and my cap in case. Uh, but a part of that is a very nice weather. So I was saying, uh, just be nice because I want to show you a couple of uh, pictures that I've put on my other phone because it's very difficult sometimes to show you live things which are dating from 2000 years old, okay? They may not exist or they may quite be quite different. So if you want to understand that, I have to show you first a couple of images, okay? So let me show you that. I just need to start my other phone. Here it is. And for you to understand the quick history of Paris. The history of Paris have started 200, 300 BC. And where it started, it started right here. This is the island. Okay, Notre Dame is located just there. Okay, so that's where we've got the, the island of Paris. And 200, 300 BC, there was a gold tribe here. Then 
the Romans arrive and the Romans are going to settle their administration on their city in the islands and develop the left bank. So have a look how the city of Paris is in that time. So sorry, you know, there's some reflection because it's, uh, it's live. Okay, so it's not uh, like when I do when I'm at home, but I think you can distinguish more or less. So you see, you see the islands and the top part of the image and the second part where you see a density of houses, this is the Roman city, okay? So you see where I'm standing right now, it's at the top of the image. Let me put it on the, on the, on the bunch like that. I can, I can put my finger on it, okay? Okay, you see, so this is the island. That's exactly where I am myself, exactly here, and that the Roman city. So this is the left bank, this is the island, and this is the right bank. So right bank is there. So at that time, you see, there is nothing, just marshes. This, this part of the district of Paris, we call it le marais, the marshes, the swamp, because that's how it was at the origin of the city. Then after that, a couple of years after that, come a king, the king of the Franc, the first French king, and he's going to gentrify that island. So let me show you how it's going to be. Exactly where we are now, exactly where we are now. Okay, let me show it to you. Here it is. Exactly here, you see. Now there's, we've got the river. We've got the river banks. And we've got the city hall, and we have got a bridge. At the origin, it was like that. You see the building which is in the back. It's the, now the city hall. You can distinguish a little bit here a kind of church. You see, on the right side of the image, it is the church which is over there, and you can also realize that at this time, the level of the city is at the level of the river. Okay, so you see, you see some boats here, like if they were going to harbor, and you see nowadays, we've got boats, but the boats are, of course, the river cruise boats. But at the origin, the boats were arriving here, they were stopping here, and then the opposite side, it was a market. So at that time, it's not anymore the Roman city, it is the Middle Age city. And this city is going to develop on the two bank. Let me show you that. I come back to my bench and then we start moving, okay? Okay. You see, in the Middle Age, the city is going to enlarge a lot. I mean, that is the island. Okay. That is the right bank. That is the left bank. So you can see the city is not anymore the island on the left bank, it's the left bank, the island on the right bank. And how that is going to be divided. Very interesting to understand. You see, I've got another image of the city here from a sky view. It's going to be divided like that. You see, we are going to have got in the island what we name La Cité. The opposite part, the right bank, it's going to be the town where the people are going to live and are going to make business, the market, the merchant, uh, the people who start uh, creating a workshop and things like that. And the Latin quarter, the left bank, it's going to be named the university. So the place of the knowledge, the place of the university, the place of the college. Okay, so let's work now. I hope you get a little bit more about where we are and how we have been divided Paris. So I'm leaving the bridge, which is in between the, uh, yes, thank you. I, I know it's not very clear, the image. I'm really sorry for that, but we're in the street. And so it's very difficult for me to, to uh, I would love, you know, if we were a webinar from home, I could show you that, but on the other hand, we would be at home. <laughs> so right now I try to to merge, if I can say the two things, being at home and being in the street. And so, Patrick, Patrick, the image is great. We, we This is a wonderful experience. Don't apologize. Okay, perfect. Because I saw the reflection, so that's why I was a little bit worrying. So now we enter into the island. You see, we have crossed the bridge, okay? The bridge is just just behind us, okay? The right bank is over there, where you saw. 
that you saw, and now we walk inside the islands. So during the time of the Latin Quarter, a lot of people, when they come to Paris, they think Latin Roman must be from the Roman period. Not at all, not at all. It's going to be the Middle Age period. During the time the Romans are here, if you remember the little map I've shown you, the Romans stay in the island where we are now and also stay in the left bank, but just have a city. It's when the first king of France arrived in the sixth centuries, 500, that we are going to develop the right bank and we are going to move the city, the place where the people are living, the town, I should say, from the left to the right. On the left bank, of course, people are still living, but it's where the university, the place of knowledge are going to be developed. So this is the time when the Latin quarter is going to be. So don't mix between Roman and Latin. You will understand later on why it's named the Latin quarter. So in fact, we're at the time of the Middle Age. Middle Age, technically speaking, start 300 AD and finish 1400 AD with the Renaissance. Here in Paris, the Middle Age with the French, with the Franc, are going to be the six centuries, so the 500. And during that time, we're going to develop in the city many new type of buildings. It's not going to be anymore the buildings from the Romans, meaning men of mulled stone and bricks, but it's going to be the building from the Middle Age made of limestone, cut stone, you see, like that. That stone, a cut stone, okay, made of limestone, not at all the bricks building from the Roman. And we are going to develop houses, but we're also going to develop, and that's very interesting, fortress, castle, and churches. And of course, the most famous churches we've developed at that time in from 1165 to 1360 is Notre Dame. So we just pass by Notre Dame because when we pass in the island, to go to the Latin Quarter, we pass in front of Notre Dame. So it's not a tour about Notre Dame, but as we pass by, well, just have a look at the cathedral. Okay, as you can see, there's lots of fences. So the cathedral is still under renovation, reconstruction, but we are now in mid-October and the cathedral is going to reopen to the public the 8th of December of this year. So I just proposed to Robert that to, I, could, I could do from home a webinar about the history of Notre Dame. So maybe we'll speak another tour about the whole history of Notre Dame. Not a street tour, but a home tour, because lots of information have to be shown. And in the street, of course, it's not very easy. So you see, there's a lot of people who come here because they want to see Notre Dame, even though uh, Notre Dame is not finished and open to the public. So this type of building are going to be the building that we do during the Middle Age. Meaning, as I said, something made of limestone, very strong building, very good building, which are going to stay for ages because you see Notre Dame started in 1165. And even if we had a fire, it's still there. So I don't say it's, uh, you can't not destroy it, but well, it's like the phoenix, you know, it's, uh, it can go down, but it's always come back. So at that time, all the administration are going to be in the islands where we are now. We've got the clergy with Notre Dame. The opposite side here, you see a huge building. This is the first hospital in Paris. Well, that one has been rehabilitated in the 1860, so it's not the original facade, you see, this is a facade from 1860, but don't forget that at the origin, this hospital, which is named Hotel Dieu, God Hotel, was the first hospital done in France, and the hat place was built in 651, 651, the first hospital. So all that in the Middle Age is going to be developed after the Roman city. So you may ask me, Patrick, where is the Roman city? Ah, that's a good question, no? If I have to reply that, I have to put down my camera like that. The Roman city is just simply underground, just under our feet. To avoid the flood, you remember, you've seen the first city was at the level of the river. So 
the first part of the Roman city by the river was underground. I mean, underground, not at that time. At that time, it was at the level of the river. But when we built the city, we decided to bury the Roman city and to build over. You see here, there's a crypt archaeologic. We can't go inside because I will lose the connection. But there's a crypt archaeologic. And if you go down, you see this staircase, like I do now. And if you enter to this building to visit the building, you will discover in that building, the people are just coming out. You see, you will enter and you will see in that building, the Roman city, like you have got in Rome, the Forum Antico. But here in Paris, it's not visible from the outside because it has been covered. But from the inside, you still can see the Roman city. So in the Middle Age, at the time of the Latin Quarter, the Roman city, by the river has disappeared. Only the part of the Roman city, which is a little bit above the river, I mean, above the river, I'm speaking about uh, uh, the, 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 the position of the, 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 uh, the meters out of the river, you see, because uh, uh, Paris has got a lot of little hill. Uh, we, do, we always think when we work in Paris, it's quite flat, but don't forget Montmartre is a hill. Uh, um, Pantheon, it's a hill, okay? Uh, Trocadero with a view on the Eiffel Tower, it's a hill. So there's lots of little hills, lots of little mounds. And so, of course, the building, the Roman building, which was above the level of the river, they could stay there, but the, the one which were at the level of the river, they have been destroyed. So you see, now we walk and we have crossed the islands. You see, the island is not that big because we have been crossing it in a couple of minutes. And we reach another bridge because we're going to go to the left bank. So, we, I show you at the beginning the town, the place where the people were going to make the merchandising or going to make the, the city life, okay? Then I, we pass by the island, which is called the island of La Cité, the city, where we have got all the administration. Nowadays, we also have got court of justice, um, uh, main police station, lots of administration. And now we cross and we say bye-bye to the island. We cross under the bridge, so it means we go the opposite side of the river, the third part of the river that I've shown you when we started the tour, which is, in fact, the left bank. You may also wonder why we say left bank and right bank. Okay, if you look, if you can distinguish, let me zoom on it. If you can distinguish the flow of the river, you will see that the river flow west. It means it goes that way that way, flow west. So you see, go that way. So this is my left hand. So if you look at the river and if you, the flow of the river, I mean, and if you have got your left hand here, it means the left bank is here. This is my right hand. So it means the right bank is the other opposite side. So it's easy to recognize now the left and the right bank for you. Just need to see the flow of the river. See that boat is going against the flow of the river. Now, there's, we've got more than 30 bridges in Paris to cross the river or to cross from the left to the right bank. But at the origin, at the time of the Latin Quarter, there was only three bridges. The one which is over there, the one that I'm on, and the one that we passed before. And you see, in the Middle Age, to cross the river, you had to pay taxes. And the bridges were covered by houses. And that bridge in front of me is named the Pont au Double, the bridge for the double, for the double price, because I, you had to pay double price to cross that bridge. So suppose, I would say, I don't know, to cross a bridge, it's $10. That one, you have to pay 20 Why 20 because that's the bridge which we're bringing you to the hospital. <laughs> so you are in a hurry to go. So you know it's always the same. Offer on demands. <laughs> if there is demands, the price is more important than if there is no demands. Uh, you see another river cruise boat which is passing under our feet, just under the bridge. And also look carefully. You see there is somebody sitting there. I don't know if you see over there. There is a lady sitting with a computer. Now let me zoom on that. Wow. Okay, you see the lady? But the lady is not important. What is important? She's sitting in front of what? Look carefully. Number 24, meaning it's a door 
or the door is completely closed. On both sides, you see windows. What does it mean? It means that was in the early time, in the Middle Age, a place to enter. You see, remember what I told you, we buried the city. So nowadays, the street level is over there. But at that time, the street level was there. And so that was an entrance. Now there's, it is the museum that you see under uh, the square in front of Notre Dame. Okay? So we leave Notre Dame on the island and we enter the left bank. So the left bank is in fact two districts in Paris. If you come to Paris, if you are in Saint-Michel, you are in the fifth district of Paris. This is the Latin Quarter. This is half of the left bank. The other half of the left bank is Saint-Germain-des-Prés. The district is number six. It's a little bit more west. So you've got two districts, five and six, which make the left bank of Paris. And inside the fifth district, you've got one of these parts, which is named the Latin Quarter. That's where we're going to go now. For that, I want you to feel how was the city at that time. Because now, for the one who have come to Paris, or the one which are going to come to Paris, you say, oh, Paris is quite a nice city with large streets and uh, easy to, 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 to commute inside. Yes, but that's not the case in the Middle Age. That's not the case in the Latin Quarter in the Middle Age. That street, now there's all, you see lots of touristic stuff here because we are in front of Notre Dame and the city hall, which is the opposite side and the court of justice, opposite side, you see here, this is the court of justice. But in the middle edge, the streets are narrow and the streets don't have concrete or even cobblestone. The streets are dried earth. And you see now, I'm walking on what? You are used to do that. You walk on a sidewalk. Okay, you see the sidewalk here, but in the Middle Age, there is no sidewalk. So you see, when you turn and when you enter the Latin Quarter, look, no more sidewalks. It means you enter in the Latin Quarter now, and you are going to realize that the size of the street, oh no, they are not the largest streets <laughs> that you are used to be in Paris. You see that street, his name, that's a funny story, that street is named La Rue du chat qui pêche. So you see it's written five, A-R-R-T, means fifth arrondissement. Well, I know that's so difficult. You know, at the end of the tour, you have to all to repeat arrondissement. And I will give a notation to the one who does good. And Robert, he's going to try it live. <laughs> and please don't laugh at him, okay? Because it's difficult to say arrondissement. So usually American people say arrondissement or English people arrondissement. Okay, so never mind. The French understand you. The fifth arrondissement. On that street, la rue du chat qui pêche. So if I translate that, rue means street, chat means cat, and I'm not even going okay. <laughs> and, and the last one is pêche. Okay, pêche is to fish. So the street of the fishing cat. Why that? Because in this narrow, very narrow street in the Middle Age, okay, there was living a priest. But that priest was very, very special. You know, it's very weird. Uh, the people which were living here were never seeing the priest during the daytime. They were wondering what that priest is doing. And they were thinking maybe that priest is doing some like black magic, you know, like an alchemist. But they were seeing how that priest get the food and they realized that he had a cat. And the cat was going from the street and in the river. <laughs> and when he was in the river, what the cat was doing, he was fishing. But instead of eating the fish, he was keeping the, the fish in his mouth and then coming back and going home. So the people said, oh my God, the cat and the priest are the same. It's like a, like, you know, like a, like a witch, like a sorcerer. So we must, uh, we must kill him, but we can't kill him because he's a priest, you know, mm, that's a bit dangerous to kill a priest, but we can kill a cat. So once they attack the cat, they catch the cat and they threw the cat in the river. Poor cat, he never came back. And for couple of weeks, they haven't seen the priest. So they say, you see, we were right. But after that, the priest came back 
on the preset to the people living here, haven't you seen my cat? So everybody, of course, is very, very annoyed. Said, no, no, sorry, we haven't seen your cat. But where were you? Oh, I was going to see my relative in the countryside and I spent a couple of days and weeks over there. <gasps> So seeing that, that street has kept the name of the street of the fishing cat, you know, in souvenir of that uh, history of that poor cat who has been thrown to the river because people thought he was a kind of a, a kind of a monster. But that street, look, it's so small, so narrow. And you see in the middle of the street, you've got a kind of channel. That's how in the middle edge, you were putting the garbages, people were throwing the garbages, then pushing the garbages to the channel, to another channel, go to the river. But imagine you walk here in the night in the Middle Edge. There is no moon, <laughs> okay? So it means it's totally dark because there is no electricity, there is no light, there is no gas, there is no light, there is no oil, there is no gas, there is no light. Best case, you've got a candle or you've got a torch, but that is the absolute best case. Most of the time, there is no light. So when you enter this part of the Latin Quarter, <laughs> Be careful not to meet in one of these streets bad people who may take your money or even worse, your life. So this Latin Quarter is the oldest part of the city of Paris. You see the street, you see the channel, and you see wherever you go here, that street is a little bit wider, but you see you have no sidewalks. They put now there's this things it's not to protect the pedestrian but to avoid the car to park so this is not at all from the middle edge this is modern but the rest of the street is dating from the middle edge the rest of the street the atmosphere you see here the house you see here are from the middle edge of course they have been renovating they have got some colors they have got some new isolation but the base of it are from the middle edge from the latin quarter how can i say that you may say patrick said that anyway <laughs> we can't say the opposite because he's on there and we're not there. It's very simple. You have to look at the shape of the house. I'm going to show you that on this one. Crepe. Yes, some crepe. But this is not the best part of Paris for the crepe, okay? You have to go to the 14th district by the Montparnasse Tower if you really want to have good, good crepe in Paris. I promise you, being originally from Brittany myself, so that's we, the Brit who invented the crepes. So believe me, 14th district, Montparnasse Tower. That's where you have got dozens of crêperies. They are the best. And don't forget, in Brittany, we don't eat sweet crepe, okay? We eat crepes, it's only um, um, sweet. I mean, we don't eat salty crepe. For the savory, we eat galette, which are made from buckwheat flowers. So never come to Brittany and ask a crepe au fromage, <laughs> cheese crepe. You, we're going to look at you like if you were a uh, a kind of uh, extraterrestrial, you know, like uh, an ovni. No, no, you must say a galette avec du fromage, cheese galette. So look, the house here, it has been renovated. You can see new stone, but in the Middle Age, it was like that. Stones, stones on a narrow door. Why stones? Because the streets are made of dried earth. So when it's rain, it gets mud and humidity. So if we start the street with wood beams, the humidity is going to go through the wood beams and it's going to bring to the structure of the building a risk of collapsing. So we always built the first part of the house in stones. Then we built in wood beams and dried earth. But look now at the shape of that house for you to understand carefully. Look from the bottom here to the top. And you are going to realize that the house is curved. Now, if I come here, you can see, you see from the top here, it's getting more and more wider. Arriving to the first floor, it's turning and go inside. You see, so the shape is like that. Like, like a half circle, more or less. Why it's like that? Why the house in the Middle Age, I've got that, that shape, you see, it's like a V. You see, like a V. It's not too uh, line. No, it's like a V. Why that? Because we wanted to enlarge the size of the street. Because we needed also to have the street with a peasant, uh, the peasant with a with a 
the passant en français, sorry, <laughs> with the, the people walking, but also the people with the carriage, the horseman, the animals, because the animals are farm freely in Paris, so you can meet a pig, you can meet a chicken in the streets, and it's muddy. So we need to enlarge the streets, but if we enlarge the street, we reduce the size of the house. So what we did, instead of enlarging the street, we just enlarge the street from the bottom, from the ground floor, where the shop are, but from the first floor, we put the street at the normal size, so like that, the house are larger. But then we can't carry on uh, making this, the, the, the house like that, because a part of that is the house are going to collapse. So from the first floor, we turn the house like that, you see, like that. So like that, from the top point to the bottom point, in fact, there is a line. So if you put a line with a plumb, you will see that from that bottom here to the complete top, it's 90 degree angles. But a part of that, you see the house is like that. So that's what we call in Paris, the belly house. Belly, like if you've got a lady who is pregnant and have got a roundish belly. Good, Suzanne. So you see, this is the Latin quarter, okay? Wherever we walk here, all the streets we walk, all the house we pass, all the, they are dating. You see, look again, that house, what I've just shown you a couple of seconds ago. You see, look, you see the wall? You see, it's turning, turning, turning. And then when you go from here, up, oh, it's twisting. Okay, that's typical. And also streets are very narrow. I show you one, you see here, we had a street before. Now it's an entrance and they built a house in between. But before that was a passage. You see, street can be very, very narrow. And in the middle of that, we start building churches. Oh yes, because don't forget, when France become France, when the first king of France arrived, we enter into a Roman Catholic country. Roman Catholic country means that we need to have churches. So the first churches, the first one are going to be Romanesque style. That's going to be more or less from 500 to 1000. And then from the 1000, 11,000, we are going to pass to the Gothic style. So in the Latin Quarter, we are going to build this house, which are going to be Gothic. This church is a perfect example of that. Okay, What is the Gothic style versus the Romanesque style? It's a style which where the church go far higher because we invented new techniques. One of these techniques is the famous flying buttresses, which are due to the flying buttresses, splitting the weight of the roof to the pillars and not to the, uh, the wall themselves. You see the flying buttresses, this is that. You see it's kind of an arc, which is going on the side of the church, all around the church, which is splitting the weight of the wall from the wall to the ex uh, outside columns. Due to that, we can suddenly build much, much more higher. The Romantic church will stop by here. The Gothic church go far. Up. And of course, more we go up, more we go far, more we get close from the sky, more we get close from the sky where we are close from God. So that's exactly what we want. We want to be the closest possible from God. And you see, this is the Gothic, but you see, this is the latest part of the Gothic, the 14th centuries, because you see this half stained glasses window, you see the style, it's not geometric. It's not the usual um, uh, style of a, of a rose window you see here. What you see, it's like a flame, flame from a fireplace. We call it the fire gothic. It's, it's, it's just a trend, okay? It's nothing too specific for the engineering. It's just trendy, okay? I'm going to show you very quickly because I don't want to disturb if there's pilgrim or people which are praying inside, but I just go inside very quickly. I just sneak inside, just push my camera inside and then, so like that, you can see the church, okay? From the time of the Latin quarter. So shh, we don't speak. I don't speak, okay? I don't, I can't, I'm not allowed to speak into a religious place.
I don't know if you can hear, there is a group of a choir who is singing. So this is the time of the Latin quarter, okay? That church is dating from the 14th centuries. We leave the church. Merci. So it was just a little bonus, okay? Because I'm not supposed to go in a church <laughs> during the tour, but as we pass in front of it, I thought it was nice. The church is named that. Somebody asked me the name of the church, Église Saint Severin. Okay, you got the name? So we carry on our walk. Fine for everybody. Connection is good. Uh, let me see. Connection is good, Patrick, and my mother will be happy that I went to church today. <laughs> and me, I will be happy when you say arrondissement at the end of the tour. So let's carry on. <laughs> so we are still in the Latin Quarter. Okay. All where we walk here is the Latin Quarter. Of course, years after years, Decade after decade, centuries after centuries, people want to have a larger street, want to have sidewalks. So bit by bit, that district is going to be transformed. But when you stay in the heart of it, well, we haven't, I'm not going to walk all around the Latin Quarter, but when you walk, when you stay in the heart of it, like here, you see, you immediately come back to narrow streets. Okay, so you see, you don't need to make a long distance to leave a larger street to go back in a narrow street. And what do you find in the narrow street? You find again the street without sidewalks, and you find again, you see, the building, which are belly, which are curved, because that's how we built in the Middle Age. And that's here, it's perfect because you see, it shows you exactly what I meant. You see, the stone from the Middle Age, but from the first floor, look here. It's wood beams. And then down, it gets stone. And you see a door. These doors are narrower and lower than the normal door because they are from the Middle Age. And you see the wood beams is above it. Okay, you get the structure. And that's all this house like that. You see the next house, same things. The stones from the Middle Age. Of course, people after that, you see, put isolation, put clay, paint. <laughs> but you see, so you just have got that little wall which is appearing from the Middle Age. But the whole house, you know, because if you scratch, you see, this is just a decoration plaster. You see, if I scratch it, look what's happened. You see, that the, that the isolation to keep the house warmer. But if that plaster or clay goes out, you find back the stone from the Middle Age. 
So don't think when you work in Paris because you don't see uh, stones or wood beams, uh, the, the, the house are new. No, 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 no. Most of the house in that district are based on middle age houses from 12, 13, 14 hundreds. So we're going to go to the north part of it for the last part of the tour to try to reach the highest part of this Latin quarter and to arrive to a place which is named the Cluny Museum. The Cluny Museum, it used to be a mansion and it used to be an abbey. But at the origin, that Cluny Museum has been built into partially the Roman bath. Oh, Roman bath, you mean, Patrick? Yes, I mean Roman bath. Robert, you see, it's like if I'm speaking to Robert and if he's asking me questions. <laughs> yes, I do mean Roman bath. I mean 200 AD. Okay, the Romans arrived in Paris 50 BC, 200 AD. They are going to build the largest Roman bath in Paris, right in front of us. What is a Roman bath? Of course, it's a place where you have got water or where you can wash yourself, but this is not the most important things. The Roman bath are there to make social relationship. The people go there, the Roman, the rich Romans, okay, go to the Roman bath, and meet other Roman people. They speak about the city, they speak about politics, they speak about economy, they speak about military subjects and things like that. And after that, also, they wash themselves. But they don't wash themselves like we do now, okay? So it means they don't go to a shower or a bath and they have got a medium uh, hot water. No, no, no. The Roman bath, it's also something that you use to have got healthy things. So it means when you go inside, thank you, when you go inside, you first unclose yourself, you get a little rest, and then you are going to go to a cold place. Then you are going to go to a, a little bit more hotter, and then you are going to go to a hot place. In Roman, in Latin, we say frigidarium, you know, frigidaire, fridge. Yes, it's coming from the Latin, frigidarium, cold. Then you go to the tepidarium, which is the middle hot. And then you go to the calderium, calderarium, which is the hot, calde, okay? And uh, so that's how they, uh, they, they do it. And the Roman bath is that. So sorry, because there is a, there is a grill in front of me. So I'm going to try to put my uh, gimbal above it. That's the Roman bath. So the building you see here is dating from 200 AD. And that's where the Romans were taking the bath. It was the largest bath in the Gaul. I'm going to try to show you an image because I prepared for you an image. Yes, 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 I know I'm very well organized. I love to make compliments to myself. So, <laughs> so let, me, let me get my other phone just a second. And just to show you how big were these Roman baths. Here it is. Okay, you see that the pictures of the Roman bath. So we just see the, 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 the corner here, which is open. But you can imagine how big it was, huge. Okay, and inside you've got all this place where you could go for resting, for bathing, for sleeping. And you have got even in the middle, a little, even a little temple, you see, for praying. So these Roman baths, and inside, yes, I haven't said, but inside it was heavily decorated, beautifully decorated. You may have no idea how it was decorated. So let me show you the inside of that bath. It's a painting representing the inside of the bath. Look at that. Look at the ceiling. You see at the, bot at the bottom of the image, you've got uh, uh, Roman people which are going inside, which are inside. So this is the inside of the bath. So you see, it's like a palace. Don't imagine that you go to your, don't imagine that you go to your bathroom, apart if your bathroom is a palace, of course. In that case, invite me your home and I will be happy to take a bath over there. But apart of that, you see, this is like a huge size house. So the Romans are going to build this huge Roman bath, which is going to be before the Frank, before the Middle Age, and when the Middle Age arrives, we built churches, and we are going to use that place for an abbey, as I said, and for churches. So you see, when you look at here, this is exactly a Roman uh, 
um, archaeological structure, walls from Rome, Cool Marina. You see, you've got here cobblestones, above bricks, above cobblestone, above bricks, above cobblestone, above bricks, like that, like layers. That, that whole thing, of course, at that time, at the origin, it was polished and painted. So it was absolutely beautiful. Now, there's, of course, it's just uh, nearly 2,000 years old, so it's a little bit more damaged, but you can see the whole structure of the outside wall of the bath. So this is Roman bricks. This is mulled stone from Paris at the Roman time. Okay, so when the Middle Age arrives, we're going to use this bus to build our abbey. What are we going to do? Oh, oh, oh we are going to leave this part because it's quite good, still quite good inside. And the part which is a little bit damaged, you see from here, we're going to cut it. You see the half circle, we cut it, and then we put a church. Hop là. <laughs> Let me up and zoom. You see, here you've got a church. So you have got here exactly one next to one, a structure from the Middle Age with a structure from the Roman time, one into the other one. So if you visit that museum, you are going to be in both, okay? You pass from Roman to Middle Age. We are going to turn the block to go to see the other side because it's absolutely beautiful. And you're going to see the building built in the Middle Age at the time, of course, of what we are speaking about the tour, the Latin quote. But one good question. I said since the beginning, Latin quote, Latin quarter, but haven't explained why we name this district the Latin quarter. It's quite simple. In the year 1000, the King of France proposed to start a university. You know, in Europe, we start having universities in different countries. In England, in Italy, in Spain, in Germany. Well, at that time, the countries are not named England, Spain, Germany, or Italy, okay? But it doesn't matter. I just named the country how they are named nowadays because if I give the real name, you are going to be completely lost. So at that time, in these countries, the people are speaking the language from the country where they live in. I mean, the French speak the Francois. The English speak the English, the German speak the good, the Spanish, they speak the Iberia, the Spanish, the Italian speak a kind of modern Latin, Italian. But then when you go to the church, don't forget the Europe is a Christian continent. So you can have differences between the Orthodox, Lateran, with the Protestant, the Anglican, whatever, but you are globally Christian. And of course, the Roman Catholic. So all these people, when they go to the church, they listen the church, the service made by the priest, not in their own language, but they listen it in Latin. Period. Then in Paris, since the six centuries, France, it's a Roman Catholic state. And it's going to stay like that till the 1901. In the beginning of the 20th centuries, we split clergy and state. But till that, we are only one uh, government, if I can say. Clergy and state are one. Meaning what? Meaning when I go to school, my teacher is going to be a monk, a priest, or a nun, a religious person. So what do you think these religious persons speak in the Middle Age? They speak, of course, the Francois when you are in Paris, but they also speak the Latin. And students are going to come from all over Europe, from England, from Italy, from Russia, from Germany, from Spain. From... They have to listen a teacher, a monk, and they have to speak with them a common language. Nowadays, they will do it in English. But at that time, they are not going to use the English, they are going to use the Latin. So the teacher speak in Latin, the student, if they are German, English, 
or French, they are going to listen in Latin. And why do they know the Latin? Because the students are not the poor. The students are the rich, rich people. And these students, which are the rich people, in fact, they can, uh, they learn, uh, the, they learn from the clergy, so they learn the Latin. So they can speak Latin, they speak their own language, plus Latin, like myself, I speak French and English. So the priests are going to teach them in Latin, but they don't have a building because we don't have built a university. We just created the university without putting any buildings, meaning they are studying in the street. And if I speak to my students in the street in Latin, and if the French people from Paris pass by them, they hear the priest speaking in Latin. So immediately the people said, oh, this is the Latin quarter, the quarter in Paris where you speak Latin, like the French quarter in New Orleans. You get it? That's why it's named the Latin quarter. And now let me show you the museum from the opposite side. Ooh, nice, isn't it? So you see, it's a bit of mixed between Baroque, uh, sorry, Baroque Renaissance and Middle Age. So used as an abbey, and now this is the Museum of Cluny, the Museum of the Middle Age, and the Roman bath starts from here. So you see, it's one museum, Museum of Cluny like the Abbey, C-L-U-N-Y. On the opposite side of that museum, we've got that huge building. What is that huge building? <gasps> because finally, in the year 1200, a monk who is named Sorbon said, but why? We have so many students in Paris. Would be nice if you built a place for them, if we built a place where they can study in. He's going to create the first building of university in Paris. And has his name Sorbonne, this university is going to be named La Sorbonne. This is that university. Oh, I want to zoom on it. Yes, here you see, Sorbonne. So that's the first university of Paris built in 1200. The building you see nowadays have been enlarged in 1500. Okay, so the, the, the church inside and part of it are from 12, but from the outside, that is 1500. But this is the first university in Paris, La Sorbonne. And you see here, everything's there because I don't know if you realized, but since I walk, since I left the river, I'm going up. Oh, it's not a high hill, okay? But it's very, you see, it's getting slow and slow, highly. Uh, hilly, sorry. So bit by bit, I go up, and that's why now I'm at the top part of it, the part, top part of the Latin Quarter. So I think we arrived to the end of the tour, and I want to keep some minutes to be able to reply to the question and all the remarks you have got about this tour. So of course, I hope you enjoyed it. Myself, I enjoy to be with you. So now I uh, just uh, stay here, and I just listen to questions or remarks you have uh, for this tour. So folks, let's give Patrick a big virtual round of applause for a wonderful presentation. Uh, Patrick, uh, yeah, let's take, uh, you know, five to 10 minutes of questions here. Joyce and Lisa were wondering, can you repeat the name of the museum you just mentioned and can you spell it? Okay, I'm going to show it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, called, it's called Cluny. C-L-O-U-N-Y. But here there is a little panel where it's written. So like that you can see it. Cluny. C-L-U-N-Y. And you see it was Abbe before. Abbe, like Abbess. All right, so DJ asks, where did they get all the limestone to build with? Did they have to drain the river? Uh-huh. No. Uh, do, um, do have, have you heard about the catacomb in Paris? Yes. So the catacomb, you know what it is? It's a huge cemetery, 25 meters, so something like 75 feet underground. These catacombs were before formerly a quarry at the level of the river, if I can say. So that was the quarry of Paris. 
So during centuries, we have been digging the underground of Paris to take the limestone from that and then to use it to build our city. When we stop digging, because it's getting dangerous, <laughs> so when we stop digging the underground of Paris, we uh, use that quarry, all these tunnels, to become a cemetery. And we took out all the graveyard from Paris, the cemetery which were inside Paris. We took them, we took the bones out of this cemetery by the churches and things like that, and we put them into the catacomb. But never forget that underground in Paris, there is more than, let's say, in miles, something like more than 20 miles of uh, tunnel <laughs> underground Paris. Uh, so the catacomb is the only part which is publicly open, but there's, uh, I should say, something like 19 other miles that you are not authorized to do. But well, if you know somebody, you always can do some uh, Ubex, <laughs> Ubex, <laughs> but this is absolutely illegal, of course. So I don't encourage you to do it because it's dangerous, but a lot of people does it. Uh, so, Patrick, we have a few people asking about the stained glass windows in the church. Uh, Pilar wants to know, do you know roughly what century those stained glass windows are from? So, there's three, peri three periods. Uh, the stained glasses I've shown you were dating from the um, 1800s. And um, they have been renovated in the 1800s because we had a fire in that church. So, uh, these ones are... are, are originally from the 1500s. So part of the church have got some from the 1500s. Some have got parts from the 1800s, the, the one I've shown you, the right side of the church, and the one which are completely at the back are from the 20s. They have been rebuilt a couple of years ago. Uh, Stephen has a question uh, about the uh, arrondishments. Pa apologize if I'm mispronouncing. Uh, so Stephen <laughs> asks, are the lower numbered arrondishments on the, le on the left bank, the older bank, and are the higher numbered ones on the right bank, the newer bank, and roughly how many uh, arrondishments are there? Oh, I can reply without saying roughly, I can reply precisely. We have got 20 arrondissements, district, if you want, or borough, if I was English. So 20 districts. And no, uh, they are not linked to the, to the left or right bank. They are linked to uh, the central position. So it's like a snail, you know, or uh, it's like a snail shell. So the first arrondissement is by the river, second arrondissement, third arrondissement, fourth arrondissement. Then you cross the river, five, six, seven. You cross the river, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You cross the river, 13, 14, 15, 16. You cross the river, 17, 18, 19, 20. So you see it's, it's turning like that, like a snail, uh, snail, snail, sh uh, snail shell, sorry. Uh, so Patrick, there's probably about 50 or so positive comments for you, uh, both in the chat and the Q&A. Um, I will note, uh, Donnie wants to know, what is the best time of the year to visit Paris? Oh, first, it depends how you like about the weather. Uh, I should say the best time, uh, if you don't want to have too hot weather, is to avoid the crowd on the hot weather of summer. Uh, that's the most crowded part of time for Paris, July and August. Uh, if you don't want to be in the too coldest weather, you have to also avoid the winter uh, from uh, mid-November to, to mid-March. And But of course, Christmas in Paris and New Eve in Paris, it's also a very nice experience. <laughs> and so on. I hope I can show you that in the next tour to show you the Christmas market in Paris and the Christmas animation in the street of Paris. That's beautiful, but it's very cold. <laughs> so if you don't like the cold or if you, you don't want to have risk of uh, snow or something like that, it's not the best time. So if you want to be, if I can say, uh, with the weather should be good or not too hot, not too warm, uh, you should come, I should say, um, uh, April to mid-June and mid-September to mid-November. Uh, Patrick, I'm going to save the chat so you can see all these positive comments. I'll also send you the feedback survey results, but I'm not going to spend three to five minutes reading them all to you. Uh, J.A. wants to know, has Paris fully recovered from hosting the Olympics and the Paralympics, or will it take more time? So, Patrick, how was it hosting the Olympics? Did you go, and is things back to normal? 
So first, I, I wouldn't say recovered because recovered, maybe I'm wrong, okay? But for me, if I translate recovered, it's like if I was ill and then I recover from my illness. And the Olympic game were not at all an illness. So I should say we are just a little bit, how can I say? Uh, we, are, um, we are missing the Olympic games. <laughs> I'm missing the Olympic games. If, we, if it could still be the Olympic games, I would be very happy. And I wish if you've got uh, lots of people from Los Angeles or, or California, that I wish them to have got a fantastic Olympic in four years. And if I can, I will go there <laughs> because, you know, it was so fantastic here in Paris. It was fantastic memories. I stay in Paris during the Olympic Games. Myself, I bought tickets for 11 events. So I went to see lots of uh, events, boxing, cycling, uh, fencing, handball, uh, basketball, basketball, uh, tennis, um, uh, uh, athletic, uh, rugby, soccer, well, many things, okay? And the rest of the time I was working. And that was one of my best time in Paris since I'm work as a guide in Paris. People were all so happy. You know, the French are quite sometimes considered to be grumpy. Okay, that's true. <laughs> but during the Olympic Games, the Parisians were, hello, how are you? Happy to meet you, nice to see you. And the tourists were, hello. Team USA, Team USA. Okay, I'm saying, no, no, sorry. Team France, Team France, but never mind. <laughs> okay, it was fantastic. Very, very enthusiastic. And people were so kind. Police was fantastic too. You know, it was very well secured. It was very well organized. Logistic was fantastic. We didn't have any incident during the game. And it was two weeks for the games on tour, 10 other day for the Paralympic, which were absolutely fantastic, where we forget during these two months, during this month, if I can say, all the troubles, all the all the things which are so tough in the world uh, during that time. So it was a fantastic uh, diversion of one month. Patrick, Americans can be pretty grumpy too, uh, especially towards tourists. So I totally <laughs> understand that. Uh, final question goes to Joanne. She says, this has been fascinating. Do you do any other tours of uh, other areas of Paris and I guess the broader question, uh, Patrick, is how do people find out more about you? Uh, do you have a website? Do you have social media? Where should people go? Yeah, yeah of course, I'm a, I'm a tour guide. You know, I'm a, I'm a licensed tour guide. So I'm, I'm licensed from the French government by the Ministry of Culture. So we be, we've got a, a national card and we are the only person in France which authorized. Of course, the tour I do in the street right now, anybody could do it. I mean, there's no law for that, you know. Uh, but it's better to do with a licensed guide because you're sure it's not going to say stupid things. But I mean, you can go in the street and you can be a guide. But if you want to bring people into any national heritage, any museum, you absolutely have to get the license from the government. And it's quite a long process and many years of studying to be able to get it, to be able to be sure that what we can say good things to the people and not stupid things. And uh, so myself, my main job is to be in-person guide, uh, bringing people in museum or if they want, of course, doing street tour like we do now or food tour or, you know, uh, we can do we can do and organize everything. So the question is just uh, if they want to contact me. Yes, uh, I think, Robert, you have got my email, le Paris de Patrick period guide at gmail.com that's my that's my email i've got a website but you know it's not a i did it myself so please <laughs> be kind don't think it's a like a like a get your guide <laughs> website it's more like a with history and also uh, every month uh, I send, uh, I, I do have a webzine that I send to the to the people who can uh, see um, history of Paris or um, exhibition and things like that in Paris. And so, yes, you can contact me by my email and I will be delighted uh, to send you the information if you want to be once in tour with me in Paris. That would be fantastic, of course. So the quality of Patrick's tours are much better than the quality of his website, but he's working on it. And it's not a bad website. It's, it's, but uh, I I'm will not, include... I'm not yeah, a professional. Yeah. <laughs> he's not a professional website designer, folks. He's a professional no. tour guide. Uh, yes. But I, I, I will include a link to his website and uh, his email okay. address uh, in the follow-up email I send everyone later today. So folks, okay, let's thank give you. Patrick uh, one more big virtual round of applause. I think we'll see Patrick in a couple of months. Patrick, any last words for the audience? Well, thank you to have been with you. You know, it's uh, now our four or five, 
fifth tour I think we do together, Robert, and it's always a pleasure because there is a large audience and people are very, um, how can I say, aware. And uh, that's nice, you know, because sometimes you have got people who who doesn't speak, who doesn't chat, who are, well, I mean, likely interested, but not invested. And I think you've got an audience which is very invested and that's fantastic, Robert, for you. And I'm happy to share this, my city with you. It's always a pleasure, you know, I'm I'm a passionate person and I love to do that. <laughs> and I love to do these, uh, this kind of tour because I love to share my city, especially if for any reason you can come inside, physical reasons, financial reasons. Uh, I don't know why, but I'm happy to share it with you at least virtually. And of course, welcome you in person if you are in Paris. My, my goal for 2025 is to find 20 more Patricks in 20 different countries, okay? So Patrick, <laughs> you are the gold standard. You are the you're, 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 you are the bar that I strive to attain to. So uh, I, okay. I wish I had you in every other European country. But <laughs> uh, Patrick, thank you so, so much. Wonderful job as always. Uh, folks, look for an e for those watching live, look for an email for me later today. Uh, also, when you exit the Zoom in a moment, make sure to take the feedback survey. So thank you all so, so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again, Patrick. Thank you so much. Have a great time. And see you next time, maybe in winter for Christmas. Bye-bye. Thanks, so. Bye-bye.